My name is Stefan Bodeker. I oversee the admissions and outreach at Columbia GSAP, and, and I'm joined this morning in this presentation by Emily Dennis in the Student Affairs Office, who will speak in, in a few minutes, uh, and by Sarah Conicchio, the Director of Admissions and Financial Aid at GSAP. And so we will uh, speak a little bit now about the next steps in your enrollment. Um, and the uh, we have, I, I wanted to just orient, uh, maybe orient the session by looking at the, the web page uh, or pointing out, not, not to take this time to look at the page itself, but to just remind you uh, that that's uh, the welcome page that we've created for all of you admitted students is really the point of orientation. This is where you'll find the recording of this session. So if you're looking at this later on, you'll be on that page. Um, you'll find recordings of the ISSO session that just happened um, on this page, and you will find the sort of the step-by-step -step guide to the, the next steps in your enrollment. Um, that page will, will actually, if you click on these, uh, the summer or fall entry sections, uh, depending on the program that you're admitted to and that you'll plan to, to enroll in, uh, it'll take you to a um, the more detailed timeline, and that is on our uh, after your admitted page on the website, uh, which is also a page that you can find through the main navigation of the website. The really uh, the 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 most important thing, in a way, is um, the third bullet point. I'll I'll jump to that, which is that you need to confirm your enrollment by April fifteenth, um, and and the enrollment is confirmed by paying the deposit. So so that's a deposit that's non-refundable, um, but it is counted towards your tuition. So you'll you'll receive that seven hundred dollars as a credit um, on your first on your first bill of the university. Um, so the other uh, and and once that enrollment is confirmed, that that's really when the wheels start turning with all of the other um, aspects that uh, regarding visa processing and and your housing lottery and things like that. Um, I encourage you to um, this the second bullet. I'm sorry, I'm going through this randomly, but the second bullet point is join open house and watch recordings. We're we're as I mentioned earlier, we're on the last day of our open house, so so I hope that you had the opportunity to participate in many of those events. Um, the majority of them will be uh, posted uh, on this on this website on the welcome website that I showed just a minute ago on the other screen. Um, and you'll find the curriculum presentations by our program directors, as well as some other uh, informational sessions, um, such as this one or the ISSO session, um, and the, the next one uh, after this uh, hour, which is on the uh, student financial services at Columbia. Um, just a note regarding the deposits, if you are a dual degree candidate um, and you plan to enroll in, in the dual degree, meaning two, two programs, you, you applied to two programs, so you'll need to accept in each of those programs, uh, you do only need to pay one uh, deposit. We, we will then, uh, once you've done that, uh, you do need to just accept the second offer as well, but don't have to pay. We will waive the, the payment for the second degree. Um, And I think here uh, I'll just mention for the next steps more specifically uh, before I turn it over to Emily uh, for the international students. That's the, the session we just held. So I hope that all of you who are here now, uh, international students were also um, on the call an hour ago. Um, the, the process on your I-20 application and the visa process. I'll just reiterate what was said uh, in the other session. It's really imperative that you start this as soon as possible. Uh, there, there is always concern, of course, about um, US embassy appointments, uh, getting appointments, getting all your paperwork and your financial uh, information in order. It does take time. Uh, every step is a bureaucratic step and, and takes you know a few days here, a few days there. Um, and so it's, it's really imperative that you begin that process as soon as possible. Um, on the screen here are just the, again, you've, you've seen them in the other meeting, but the contact emails for the ISSO office, uh, their web page, um, and then the presentation, as I mentioned itself, uh, will be hosted on our website and we'll send an email out with that. Uh, but with that, Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you. The website is really structured um, sort of by calendar, um, and, and so I think that's probably how we'll, we'll go through it here. Do you? Um, 
Do you want to take over? And since I'm sharing the screen, just let me know when I should advance to the next page. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. As Stefan mentioned, my name is Emily Dennis. I am the Assistant Director of Student Affairs at GSAP. So you will see a lot of me throughout your time, both onboarding to GSAP and your time here at the school. Um, I do a little bit of everything, so I'll be working with you to actually get you here to GSAP and also with registration and all sorts of things once you arrive on campus. And relevant to today specifically, I am also the housing liaison for GSAP students, and we'll talk about housing in just another minute. Um, but really excited to be here and I guess to see everybody on Zoom, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of people on the call today who have already submitted your tuition deposit, which is great. Um, some of you probably have not, but the first step that you will need to take after submitting your deposit is to activate your university ID or your uni. So some of you may have already done this. This might be old news. Bear with me for the folks who have not yet taken this step. Um, but essentially, after you submit your tuition deposit, um, it comes to me, I do a little back end processing, and then typically within two business days of depositing, you're going to get an email asking you to activate your university ID, your uni. Um, your uni is typically, it's like your first name initial, last name initial, and then four digits. Um, and you'll have to activate it before you're able to move forward with any of the other steps that we're gonna talk about today. Um, so if you deposit and it's been, I would say more than like four business days, please be in touch with me so I can look into it. Um, but activating your uni is really the first thing you need to do um, in order to start the process of getting ready to come to GSAP this fall. Once you have your uni, you can then log in and activate your Columbia University email, which is hosted by Gmail. Um, it's called your Lion Mail account. Um, and we're not going to actually email you at your Lion Mail account until the first day of classes. So this means you do need to continue to check and update your personal email that you used when you were applying to GSAP, um, because we're not actually going to contact you anywhere else until you actually make it to campus. Um, Stefan, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, great. So I mentioned housing, and I think this is going to be a big piece of what we're talking about today. And I know that finding housing is one of the biggest slash most stressful components of not only moving to New York City, but going to grad school and all of that good stuff. Um, so a little bit about the way that housing works um, for GSAP students. Um, we do have on-campus housing available. Um, oops. <laughs> we do have on-campus housing available for students who are interested in it, but I say that with a big caveat because there simply are not enough spots in university housing to house every single student who wants it. Um, that is just a reality of being a large university in a city that has limited space and limited real estate. Um, so in order to equitably distribute the housing allocations that we do have, GSAP holds a lottery every year um, prior to everybody starting in the summer or fall semesters. Um, so if you are interested in on-campus housing, you're going to have to apply to the housing lottery. Um, so what that looks like is once you have submitted your deposit, activated your uni, you'll go on to the Columbia Residential website. And all of this information is emailed to you shortly after you submit your deposit. So these links you see here on the screen, um, you could access on the GSAP website or in the email that you received from my office. Um, but you'll need to log on. Oh, and there's a link in the chat. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so you'll need to go on and submit your housing application. Um, we're, what is it, March 31st. So you still have um, almost three weeks to submit your housing application. If you haven't done so already, that's completely fine. Um, getting it in earlier is not, it's not to your advantage. As long as you submit it by the April 20th deadline, you'll be included in the first round of the housing lottery. Um, the way that the lottery works is that it is random, but we do prioritize folks who are relocating, relocating to New York from the farthest away. And so that oftentimes means our international students are privileged in the lottery to a certain extent. And the reason for that is because international students often have the hardest time finding housing 
in New York City because not being a US citizen makes it very difficult to impossible to rent a market apartment. So it's a really important resource to have on campus housing available to students who don't have the ability to rent an apartment anywhere in the city. Um, so we do try to prioritize folks who are coming from a different country, but we also prioritize people who are coming from the farthest away. So I preface all of this to say, if you're already local to New York, or if you're living in maybe New Jersey, Connecticut, there is really no purpose to applying for the housing lottery because you're not going to receive a spot. Um, you simply are, you're, you're within the radius with which we would not consider you for university housing. Um, there are extenuating circumstances, such as if a student needs um, disability accommodations. In that case, you absolutely can submit a housing lottery, even if you're already here in New York City. But by and large, um, if you live closer to campus than like Baltimore, Maryland is typically the cutoff. Um, so please keep that in mind when you're considering submitting your housing application. Um, Let's see, as I mentioned, the deadline is April 20th. So we will hold the lottery shortly thereafter, um, probably, I don't know, by late April, if students have been selected in the housing lottery, you would receive an email that there's been an update to your housing application and it will prompt you to log back into the housing portal to actually see whether you were awarded a housing spot or not. And to give you an idea of the availability, um, this year, GSAP has about 200 students who are living in campus housing, and we have around 800 students enrolled in the school in any given academic year. So again, there's not enough spots for us to house every single student who would like to live on campus. Um, that is, again, just the reality of Columbia University and being in New York. Um, but typically, people who really need housing are able to get it or able to find something near campus. Um, when you submit your housing application, you're simply applying to get a spot in housing, but you're not actually applying for a specific room in a specific building or anything like that. You're not actually selecting your unit at this time. Um, that would come later. If you're selected in the lottery, you'll receive further instructions from Columbia Residential on how to actually select your unit and how to move forward with the housing selection process. Um, Okay, um, students who receive lot housing via the lottery are guaranteed housing for the duration of their program. So that means if you win the lottery and you choose to stay in Columbia housing, you get to stay there until you graduate. And you do have to move out when you graduate. You can't stick around beyond like the end of May, whatever year it is that you're graduating. Um, but you, you don't have to move out for summer breaks. You don't have to reapply for the lottery if you're in a program that lasts for more than one year. We do guarantee it for the duration of your time here. However, I would like to add that for dual degree students, this can be a little bit more nuanced. If you are starting a dual degree program um, and you already have been admitted to and deposited to both of those programs. So for example, if you are doing a dual MARC and historic preservation degree. Um, that's a four year dual degree program. So if you already know that you're doing the dual degree program, your housing, if you are selected in the lottery, is guaranteed for the four years that it would take you to complete the dual degree. If you are starting one degree program this fall, but later decide to add an additional degree program, your housing is not guaranteed for the duration of that second degree. Um, we do have to prioritize students who are incoming, students who are, again, coming from other countries. So if you add a degree later or for any other reason, extend your studies at GSAP, your housing will typically expire at the end of whenever you would have completed that first degree. Um, and if you have any questions about that, you can always contact me at a later date. Um, but that is important to note because I think um, it sets people up for a surprise if you extend your studies and then um, don't have housing. Um, let's see. And also important to note, we have folks who are starting their degree program in the summer, and then we have people who are starting in the fall. Um, everybody, regardless of whether you're a summer or fall start, you should be applying for fall housing. Um, uh, if you are starting in the summer, which would be a late May start, um, you would be able to move into housing prior to the start of class, but you have the housing portal 
when you log in and you see it, this will all make sense, but you do need to apply for the fall um, and you'll be able to move in beforehand. And really quickly, I'll also mention just a couple resources that are not campus housing, um, but are also options for students who are looking for accommodations. Um, and the first is the off-campus housing marketplace. This is a resource for students across the entire university. Um, it's managed by a third party, so none of these listings are vetted by me or GSAP or anyone at Columbia, but it's a resource for people who are looking maybe to live off campus in the area surrounding uh, Columbia University. And some of the listings might be further away. They might be in Brooklyn or in the Bronx, um, maybe not super close to campus, but it's an option for people who maybe are unfamiliar with New York and just looking for units that they know are in the area or are in areas where Columbia students typically live. And then another resource is the International House, which is dormitory style living available to graduate students across all of New York City. Um, the International House or I House is located just a few blocks north of the Columbia campus. So that's also an option for people who maybe don't want to live on campus, but um, want to live somewhere in the vicinity of Columbia. Um, I'm thinking if there's anything else I need to tell you about housing. Um, if it's not clear by now, it is not required to live in campus housing. That's a question I get um, pretty frequently. Um, and if you, I guess about the accommodations specifically, um, all of the Columbia residential housing is apartment style. So there might be studios, one, two bedrooms, even suite style living with like five bedrooms and two bathrooms. Um, and Columbia Residential will help you take care of locating roommates if you end up living on campus. Um, and couples and family housing is also available, um, but please do keep in mind that if that is an option you're interested in pursuing, um, that the spots for couples and families are a little more limited than they are for um, individual housing. And you do have to provide documentation that the people living with you are actually your partner and actually your children. Um, you cannot bring a parent or sibling or friend to live with you in campus housing unless that individual is also a Columbia student. Um, just looking in the chat to see if there's any questions about housing. And I don't think so. So I think we can go to the next slide now. Um, but again, feel free to pop anything in the chat if um, you have any questions and you can always email me later too. Um, okay, so immunization requirements. This is something that you can take care of concurrently with applying for housing. But again, you do need to have your uni and have it activated in order to move forward with this. But um, it is a policy in New York State that every student attending a university has to provide immunization documents for meningitis and MMR, MMR meaning measles, mumps, and rubella. Um, this is not a rule that GSAP came up with. This is mandated by New York State, so there are really no exceptions. Um, you do have to provide this documentation to the university before you're able to fully matriculate here. So once you've activated your uni, you'll need to go into the Columbia Health Portal, um, and the link is right there on the left-hand side, and you'll need to fulfill the immunization requirements as soon as possible. Um, this is most pressing for students who will be starting in the summer, um, but if you're starting in the fall, I still recommend that you take care of this as soon as possible to avoid any kind of delays, because if you fail to submit your immunization records, or if you maybe submit your meningitis, but not your MMR or what have you, um, you will be prevented from registering for class. Um, so it's really, really important that you get these documents in and that you do so ASAP so that there's lots of time for Columbia Health to process these records. Um, at peak times of year, such as right now, when everybody is preparing to enroll in the summer and fall semesters, it can take, I would say, an average of two weeks for your immunization records to be received and processed by Columbia Health and for your registration to be like open. Um, so it's really important that you get these in soon so that there's no delays and that you're able to register when registration opens. And we'll talk about registration in a minute. Um, but please do not upload your documents thinking that everything will be cleared tomorrow. Um, it typically takes a lot longer than that. Um, Columbia Health serves the entire university. They're not just working with GSAP students. So please keep that in mind when you're submitting your records. 
Um, also, please do not send your immunization records to me. Do not send them to the admissions office. We cannot do anything with them. Please send them to Columbia Health. Um, that is the only safe and um, secure way to have your records stored with the university. Um, and relatedly for Columbia Health Insurance, um, if you are an international student, you will be enrolled in Columbia Health Insurance no matter what. Um, other students who are not international but are enrolled full-time are given the option of having Columbia Health Insurance. Um, if you already have insurance coverage, you are able to provide documentation of your coverage and it can be waived, so you're not enrolled in Columbia Insurance and on another policy, um, but you have to tell Columbia Health what to do. So please visit their website um, and certify whether or not you will be enrolling in Columbia Health Insurance. Um, the website also has information about when your health insurance coverage will begin, how much it costs, all of that good stuff. Um, I'm not an insurance expert, so I won't go into too much detail on that, but please visit the health website for more information. Um, okay, I see a question we, in the chat. Oh, Stefan, were you going to add something? Yeah, I was just going to jump in. Sorry to, to interrupt, but I was just going to um, maybe uh, echo something you were saying uh, to, to emphasize it. Um, which, which is that, you know, we work, our teams at GSAP work very closely with our students and supporting our students uh, throughout, throughout their studies at the school. Um, but there are many aspects of the student experience that are really managed by the university and different departments at the university. And so, so when, when there is, for example, this, this scenario where um, a, a student doesn't have the, um, the vaccination requirements cleared and there is a registration hold there is nothing that emily or i or anyone at gsap can do about that um, because it's really those registration holds are placed by the university and by the university's health uh, office um and and we can't do anything right it, it really just needs to be processed and cleared by by the health uh, office so so that's uh, that's something that Emily mentioned, but I just want to really reiterate that because we 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 of course want to be as supportive as possible, um, but we don't have a, a a way a mechanism in the system to somehow waive any of these requirements for for students. Uh, so so just just a little footnote. Yeah, thank you, Stefan, and that's a good point. Um, there are a lot of things you'll find about coming to Columbia. There are things that GSAP manages, and then there's things that are managed by the larger university. Um, and this happens to be one of those things. So there's, again, there's nothing we can do if you fail to submit your immunization records in time. Um, I can register you after your records have been received and that hold has been lifted, but we can't make any exceptions if you don't submit your documentation until the first day of class. So again, just keep that in mind as you're preparing um, to join us this summer or fall. Um, before we go on to the next slide, I'll just address a couple of the questions I saw pop up in the chat. Um, and I'll start with the question from Rodrigo, since it's related to um, health insurance that I was just touching on. Um, international students are enrolled in Columbia Health Insurance automatically. There are rare cases in which you may be able to waive the university health insurance if you're able to prove that you have comparable coverage from another insurance company. I can't speak in much more detail than that. So please visit the Columbia Health website for more information. And you can always reach out to them if you have questions or concerns about what you need to do coverage wise before joining us at Columbia. Um, and I also see a question from Amer about renting. Um, for non-US citizens coming to the US, is off-campus housing not an option at all? Um, I don't want to say it's not an option or that it's never possible. Um, but a lot of landlords will be looking for people who can prove their U.S. residency, or perhaps you would need to have a guarantor who, who is a U.S. resident. Um, every landlord is different. I'm not a landlord. I can't speak for every landlord or management company in New York City. Um, but in general, um, international folks have more barriers to renting apartments here in New York City than their American citizen counterparts. Um, and you can always email me if you have more questions about that, and I'm happy to connect you to additional housing resources. Um, 
So again, I won't say it's impossible, but we are aware that it can be more challenging for students who are relocating from outside of the US. Um, I see a question about the patient portal, but it doesn't pop up on the login page. Perhaps your uni is not activated yet. Um, you can also email me and we can troubleshoot that together. Um, and Kyung Ho, um, you had a question about the cost of on-campus housing. Um, I think somebody shared the link to Columbia Residential in the chat. So please check that out. It gives you kind of an idea of what the cost of housing for on-campus housing looks like. Um, but it ranges depending on what your specific accommodations are. So a studio apartment will perhaps be more expensive than living with four roommates in a suite style apartment. So there's various price points depending on what kind of living setup you're looking for. Um, and I'll also say that sometimes living on campus is not um, more affordable than living off campus. It really depends on what kind of living arrangements you're looking for. So of course, a studio apartment on campus might be comparable to a studio apartment off campus, but if you're looking at off campus apartments that are in luxury buildings, it will be cheaper to live on campus. So again, there's price points for everybody um, and it depends on your specific accommodations. I'm just checking in the chat again. Um, I see a question about dosage for the MMR vaccines. I will refer you to Columbia Health for more information on that, um, since I'm not sure about the timing of getting a second dosage. Um, and a question about providing proof of immunization. Typically, your standard immunization records that were provided um, when you received your vaccination um, if they are in another language, I'm not sure if you need to provide a translation or not, but Columbia Health will have more information on that. So I'll direct you to their website for a firmer answer than I'm able to provide. Um, and as Sarah just put in the chat, you can also contact the immunization compliance team directly for more information about immunization. Um, they're pretty good about answering over email. So please do be in touch with their office if you have specific questions about the documents that you'll be able to upload. Um, okay, I think we're ready for the next slide. Hi, so um, students who are joining us for the MR program, um, the prerequisites will only um, apply to you. So anybody else, you can disregard this part. Um, MARC students must complete any um, pending prerequisites and submit course transcripts prior to enrolling this fall. So as you may have remembered from the application process, you filled in a section to report the prerequisites you have taken and those that are pending. So if you um, will be able, you actually will be able to see your missing items um, when you log into your application portal. So um, that's not the last of the application portal. Um, you definitely want to check in with that to make sure that you have submitted your final documents. So if you have taken the prerequisite courses, um, then this doesn't apply to you. If you still haven't taken some, some are pending, you can um, register for them this summer before you enroll. And we will need to have those final transcripts um, before you enroll in order to show the um, proof that you have taken these prerequisites. Um, and please note, prerequisites um, must be undergraduate coursework and can be taken at um, any accredited college or university. Uh, once completed, we will require the official transcript, um, and that must be sent directly to um, GSAP from the institution, so you're not able to send those directly. Um, and that's all I have for the MR prerequisites. And I'll actually add um, the link here to refer to. 
And for the credentials verification, all enrolling students must provide the official final transcripts from each post-secondary institution attended. So this means college or university. If you um, included your high school on your application, we do not need those transcripts. Um, so a transcript is required for all of the schools you have listed on your application and attended. So any one of those on your application portal that is showing that's missing, you will need to have it sent directly to us. Um, anything that you've uploaded um, during the application stage is um, considered unofficial um, because um, the official documents need to come directly from the institution. So for transcripts um, to be considered official, you can have it sent directly from the registrar's office, um, or if you have attended an international university and you've completed your bachelor's degree there, um, you can use the West ICAP uh, delivery service um, or if you've attended um, an international university in China, we will also accept um, the Chesik. It's actually, it was Chesik, but um, now it's called uh, China Credentials Verification, CSSSD. So you can use that as well if you are submitting um, a China Credentials Verification for your bachelor's degree. It um, you will need to um, submit two documents. And I'm going to add a link here so that you can reference the two documents that will be required um, if you're going to use the CSSSD. Um, and if, again, if you have completed your bachelor's degree at an international institution, a course by course international evaluation is required either by World Education Services, WES, um, or the CSSSD. If you haven't completed um, your bachelor's uh, at the international university and you just took courses there, only the official um, transcript is required, so not the WES um, for that um, situation. Um, if you haven't conferred your degree yet, please wait until you confer your degree before sending um, those official documents because the official documents definitely needs to have your proof of bachelor's degree um, so that we can finalize your um, final documents. And all of these documents should be submitted before um, September 5th. Um, and I'm going to add um, one more thing. If you have any questions about your particular requirements for that, just reach out to us um, and we can take a look. And I think that's all I have. Let's see. Are there any questions about that? Um, we have a question from Adrian. My undergraduate school uses parchment to deliver transcripts electronically. That is sufficient. We accept parchment um, all the time. So that's definitely acceptable. The next question, I've submitted my final transcript, which was shared directly by my undergraduate university, and it's been marked as received on the portal. However, there is also an additional mention of final transcript. What is that about? Um, we'll take a look at your, um, your record, and I'll, I'll need to go offline and let you know what that um, what that is. Next question. It's, it's, sorry, Sarah, just to clarify, it is a two step process because we we acknowledge the receipt of your official transcript, um, but we do need to actually verify to make sure that it's the final one showing what what Sarah mentioned before that that transcript, even though it's official, also uh, is your your final one that conf uh, shows the degree conferral 
Um, so that's usually why there is a there is a the second step uh, that that we take to just to just double check that the the degree conferral is reflected on that official transcript, and then we mark it off uh, manually as the final transcript being received. Yes, that that's correct, Amir. That is what it is. Um, and Carla, what if my transcripts from the other universities are included in the official transcript from the university I got my degree from? So um, if you have significant transfer credits, um, we do require the official transcript from that other university because um, the, the grades will not be listed on that final transcript. And if you have very specific questions about um, your transcripts, please do let us know. Let's see on the next slide. Okay, yeah, back to me. Um, so a little bit about picking up your university ID cards. Um, for students who are starting in the summer, you need to upload your photo to go on your uh, Columbia ID card by no later than May 22nd. So that gives the ID office about a week to print and deliver your ID cards to my office where you will probably be picking them up. Um, and I'll have more information and we'll be emailing you about card pickup as we get closer to the actual start of your studies. If you're starting in the fall semester, you can submit your university photo or the photo for your ID card. Um, I would recommend no later than two weeks prior to the start of class. Um, typically, you're able to upload your photo as soon as you have your uni. So once you're activated, you can give it a try. Um, and you should have received information about uploading your ID card when you received the activate your uni email from my office. Um, and then for everybody, um, whether you're starting in the summer or the fall, uh, you are required to complete a mandatory pre-orientation tutorial before arriving on campus. This is a university requirement um, and it, you'll receive an email from the Office of University Life with more information. But this is about a one hour asynchronous tutorial that kind of orients you to being part of Columbia University and also provides guidelines for being a good citizen of the university community. So if you're starting in the summer, um, please try to get this done before the start of classes in May. Um, I recommend that when you get the email with the link to complete your pre-orientation tutorial, do it, set aside time, set aside an hour and get it done as soon as you get that email. It doesn't need to be the day you get the email, but do it sooner rather than later. So it's something you can check off of your to-do list. And then um, for people in the fall start to the semester, um, please make sure that, again, you get this done before arriving on campus um, and before classes start. You can take care of the tutorials at any time once you receive the link from the Office of University Life. Um, so again, please take care of it as soon as possible. And if you fail to complete the mandatory tutorials, um, GSAP will impose a registration hold on your account for your second semester of classes. Um, so please get it done. More information to come from the off Office of University Life. Next slide, please. Okay, and I saw a couple of questions about registration in the chat. So hopefully this will quell some of your curiosity. Um, but if you are starting a program in the summer, you will not register until May 24th through 26th. Um, registration can't happen any earlier than that. There will be an ad drop period during the first week of classes, um, but you'll receive more information from my office about the nitty gritty of how to actually register for classes and what you need to do to actually enroll in the courses. Um, so for summer start students, that will be in May. And if you're starting in the fall, class registration will take place on August 29th through 31st. So same thing, um, we will send you lots of information about how to register as well as what you need to register for. Um, so just know that that email and information is coming. Um, if you are starting in the summer, we encourage you to arrive at least one to two days before orientation. Um, 
you're welcome to arrive even earlier if you so choose, but we strongly encourage you to avoid showing up to the airport the day of orientation. So make sure that you are here and give yourself enough time to get settled. Same thing for folks who are starting in the fall. We encourage you to get here um, in advance of your program's orientation. And for fall start students, um, there are different orientation dates based on your program. If you're entering MARC, your orientation will be September 1st. If you're entering UP, it will be on August 31st and September 1st. For HP students, it will be August 31st. And for other students and other programs, the first day of classes and orientation will all take place on September 5th. Um, for folks who are entering the CDP program this summer, you probably know this by now, but if you don't, now you know that you have a four week online tutorial that may be completed remotely. If you need more information about completing the remote portion of the CDP program, please reach out to them directly. Um, I don't have any more information about the pedagogical aspect of what the um, online tutorial looks like, and I'm happy to point you in the right direction. Um, and then lastly, for people starting in the summer, um, the first day of classes will be on July 5th. Um, and if you're starting in, sorry, July 5th is not the right day. I think that's for intro and, or no, that's sorry, for- Sorry, Emily, that, that sorry. is the computational design practices specifically. Yes, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. The first day of classes for CDP, July 5th. First day of classes for the other summer start students, May 30th. Sorry for the confusion. Um, and if you're starting in the fall semester, classes will begin on September 5th. So that's the first Tuesday after Labor Day. Um, and then for everybody in every single program, there will be an all-school lunch hosted by GSAP's Dean, Andres Hake, on September 6th. More information to come, but that's open to the whole school and we are excited to see you there. I mean, take a quick look at the chat because I know that I said a couple of things that may have been confusing. Yeah, um, there, there's one, the most recent question actually just echo, echoing what, what we just said. Yes, um, Kyung Ho, it, it is okay for MSCDP students only um, of the summer start programs. It's okay to arrive for the first day of classes, July 5th. Um, so that program is, is the only of the summer start programs that where students do not need to be uh, in person uh, during that first month in starting May 30th. Um, yes, sorry to have misspoken. I'm afraid I might have confused everyone starting in the summer, but um, CDP has that specific start date in July. Um, everyone else is May 30th, so sorry. <laughs> And, and regarding Emily, regarding the, there was an earlier question that I think you addressed regarding um, the registration period, but I wanted to just maybe clarify it's it, maybe it's it's obvious to us, but it should be stated also that registration is done online, right? So you you do it's not an in person registration process, the class registration, and so Emily mentioned that she will send very specific sort of instructions, and you'll get very clear sort of guidelines on how that works. Um, but Emily, maybe maybe just uh, can you can you just talk give, give a sentence yeah. or two about the registration process? Of course, and I think you're right. I think this is one of those things that feels obvious to us because we are already here. But for all of you who are not here yet, registration does take place online on a platform called Student Services Online or SSOL. You will spend a lot of time using SSOL throughout your time here at GSAP. Um, Again, I'll have more information to share in the coming weeks and months about what registration specifically needs to look like, but do know that it will be online and it will take place specifically within these designated registration dates. Um, this is why it's very important to submit all of your immunization records before registration opens so that you're able to actually register during the initial registration period. Um, there is an ad drop period in every semester so if you are not registered for classes um, during the initial registration period, you can add or drop anything during that shopping period. Um, I don't have those dates off the top of my head, but they are available on the academic calendar on the website. And we will surely share that information with you um, in the email that you'll receive from my office with all of the instructions about registration. 
And thank you for sharing the academic calendar. That's in the chat for anybody who is curious about seeing all of these important dates all in one place. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Sarah. Um, I just wanted to also close with just a few more of these emails there. I think they've probably been populated in the chat, but just as a as a reminder and overview, um, the the uh, topic of um, uh, cost of attendance and, and uh, financing your education is the topic of our next session starting in a few minutes um, at, at 11 o'clock Eastern time. So we'll be joined by our colleagues from Student Financial Planning uh, to, to speak to you about that. Um, but I'm already including their, their email address here as well for your reference. 